In the dry bush country of Africa, there lives a giant tree. Its flowers are the home of magic spirits, and its branches the dwellings of many creatures. Strange birds with even stranger customs. Fearful insects and animals that cry like spirits in the night. Millions of years ago, when God was creating Africa, he became angry with this tree because it would not live where he told it. One day, in a rage, he tore the tree up and pushed it back into the ground, upside down. Since that day, the tree has always grown with its roots in the sky instead of its branches. So, it is an ugly tree, a grotesque tree. It is Africa's interesting tree, and it is called the Baobab. When you first see a Baobab, you can almost believe that legend. But like any other tree, it starts from a seed. The baobab is now known to be one of the oldest living things in the world. It grows quite quickly, in baobab terms, for the first 250 years, but conditions in the semi-desert country are so harsh that only a few seedlings reach even this size. Dusty droughts come frequently, killing many trees and even 250-year-olds can be consumed by the fierce bush fires which sweep this dry country every few years. The survivors bear the scars of their early life with a certain ugly dignity. Now too big to be damaged by anything but elephants or men, they grow infinitely slowly, and some mammoth baobabs are thought to be over 2,000 years old. Dotted across the barren plains, they dwarf the surrounding vegetation. Their trunks are often hollow and the branches full of holes, so that each tree is an oasis of shade and shelter for animals and birds, many of which would not exist here if the baobabs did not provide such an abundance of homes. A solitary giant baobab looking so derelict from afar is in fact a tenement that soon, with the start of the rainy season, will be bursting with animal life. The enormous baobab is slow to put out leaves. Its smaller neighbours are already in blossom to attract the flush of insects that will come with the rains. This massive increase in the food supply brings the birds into breeding condition, and soon the bush country resounds with the courtship displays. All these birds nest in holes. A large baobab may have as many as 20 suitable holes, and so for the hornbills, the rollers, the parrots and kingfishers, the tree is the basis of the territory which they proclaim and defend with their various displays.
The Wahlberg's eagle built her nest in the tree well before the smaller species because her incubation period is much longer and the chick must hatch while there's plenty of food around. Surprisingly, the presence of an eagle's nest in the tree is an added incentive to the smaller birds. The eagle will drive off any snake or monkey that tries to climb the tree and so provides a protective umbrella, making it a safer place for the smaller birds to raise their families. Not all the eagle's neighbours appreciate her protective role. The fork-tailed drongo continuously reminds her and the other inhabitants of the tree that she's a bird of prey and therefore should be mobbed. Her mate, perching quietly on a nearby tree, gets even more humiliating treatment. You might think that the eagle would turn upon its tormentors and kill them. It obviously has the power and the speed to do so, and it does, after all, feed on smaller birds, which it catches in the air. But drongo flesh is distasteful and musky, and no bird of prey ever eats them. So perhaps this explains the eagle's lordly indifference and the drongo's brazen behavior. Not far below the eagle is a hole being spring cleaned by a pair of rufous crowned rollers. They haven't taken possession yet and a hornbill, looking for a nest hole, hangs around hopefully. On the other side of the tree, a pair of red and yellow barbets are also clearing out a hole. They regularly break off to indulge in the more stimulating activity of flying to the borders of their territory for a song battle with a neighboring pair. eagle's protection also extends to another species of roller, the broad build. Not all the birds in the baobab nest in holes. The red-billed buffalo weavers build coarse grass nests inside a densely packed mass of thorny twigs. Placing the first twig is always the most difficult. But once a few are wedged on the branch, the nest grows rapidly.
In Africa, not all sticks are what they seem. When the nest itself is complete, the weavers add more thorns to form an impenetrable barricade along all approaches to it. Some of the larger nests take several months to build and contain tens of thousands of twigs. Up to this stage, the males have done all the work. But now that the nests are finished, the drab brown females put in an appearance. And when they do, the males display frantically in an effort to attract a mate. Having looked over all the nests, the female returns to the one of her choice, carrying a small twig to add to the lining. The rejected male looks thoroughly miserable as the female moves into the chosen nest. But the proprietor is ecstatic and steps up the intensity of his display. Africa's most spectacular tree is also host to some of its most dramatic insects. This nine-inch stick insect is perfectly camouflaged among the branches as it munches a baobab leaf. On another branch are what appear to be thorns, but baobabs don't have thorns. It's a moth that tightly rolls its front pair of wings to resemble thorns. On an acacia branch where it should spend the day, it's almost impossible to detect. Here and there, poking out from the bark of the baobab, are translucent wax tubes some two inches long. These are the entrance tunnels to the hives of the tiny sweat bees. Sweat bees got their name from their habit of drinking perspiration from the brows of travelers, sweat often being the only moisture available in this desiccated country. Of all Africa's insects, the species of praying mantis known as the diabolical idol is probably the most grotesque. Over four inches long, it's powerful enough to catch and kill a baby gecko. Most of its enemies can be frightened off by its flashing the brightly colored eye spot on the underside of its arms. And so, as the season progresses, an ever-increasing community of wildlife benefits from the presence of the extraordinary upside-down tree. For perhaps 2,000 years it has stood here, a silent witness to many strange happenings, human and animal, but surely none stranger than the remarkable nesting procedure of its perennial tenant, the red-billed hornbill. He's in the middle of courtship and waits with a juicy beetle as a present for his mate. Hornbills probably pair for life, but each breeding season they go through the entire courtship procedure again.
Up to this point, there's nothing particularly unusual in their behavior. But now the female begins the strange ritual that makes hornbills unique among birds. Collecting mud from a rain puddle, she carries it back to the tree where she passes it around the entrance of a hollow branch. Using a rapid sideways movement of her beak, she plasters the mud into place, gradually reducing the size of the opening. Depending on the size of the hole, this mudding operation may take anything from a couple of days to two weeks, involving up to 40 trips a day to collect mud. The purpose of all this activity is to make the nesting hole a safer place to raise her young. When the entrance has been reduced to a hole about one and a half inches across, she'll squeeze inside. Then, using the mud that has fallen into the nest, she'll continue to plaster up the entrance until there's only a slit a quarter of an inch wide and two inches long, through which she will receive all her food. By courtship feeding, the bond between the pair is reinforced. And a very strong bond is essential, as for the next six weeks, the male will not see her again, but must faithfully continue to bring her food. After a while, the mud hardens like cement, forming a barrier strong enough to keep out almost any predator. She just manages to force herself through the entrance and into the hollow where she will lay her eggs and which will be her prison for the next six weeks. Oddly, the birds seem to pay no attention to the fact that part of the trunk had been replaced by glass in order that we may film, for the first time ever, inside the nest of a hornbill. This female had laid two eggs and they had taken three weeks to hatch. The male, who had been bringing food about 30 times a day, has to step up the supply to cope with the extra mouths. It's probably the strange new sound of the baby's hungry cries which stimulate him to greater efforts. The rains have brought on plenty of grasshoppers and mantises and other succulent insects. And as they pass through the slit, the female eats the largest herself and passes the smaller ones on to her chicks. Shortly after she sealed herself in, she molted all her wing and tail feathers. And now they're growing back. If anything had happened to her mate during this period, the female, unable to fly, would have had to stay in the nest and starve to death. A gecko is squeezed through the slit. Though it's been killed, the nerves in its tail are still active, and when it falls off, it wriggles violently. This is a defense mechanism. The idea is that the tail should fall off when a predator attacks, and by wriggling conspicuously, draw the predator's attention away from the gecko, allowing it to escape. This time, it's happened too late. Hygiene in the nest is simple. The female reverses up to the slit and squirts her droppings outside. The chick's droppings she picks up and uses to reinforce the plastering around the hole. 
The window also was a hole in need of plastering, so she constantly smeared the glass. About three weeks after they hatch, the chicks start to take insects direct from the male. At this time, the female, her new feathers fully grown, becomes restless. Forty days after she's squeezed into the hole, she starts to chip away at the imprisoning plaster. Breaking out takes around five hours and, after so long in confinement, is an exhausting exercise. But the process is not yet over. The next stage is even more remarkable and something that wasn't known until this film was made. In addition to food, the male now brings a supply of slugs and sticky berries. The chicks rub these around the edges of the damaged entrance. Now, with dirt from the floor of the nest, plus their own droppings, they go to work to reseal the hole. Apart from the slugs and berries that the male brings, the adults play no part in this rebuilding. This powerful instinctive drive in such young defenseless chicks is one of the most incredible pieces of behavior in the world of birds. Four days of non-stop plastering reduces the hole to a narrow slit once more. During those four days, the female sits around sunbathing and preening and paying no attention to the nest. But now she helps out with the feeding. As bigger and bigger prey is squeezed through the hole, the chicks grow rapidly. <laughs> 